The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Welcome to Postcards, I'm Dana Johnson. Today we're going to be visiting three talented artists of western Minnesota. First, we're traveling to A to Z Letterpress Printing in Montevideo to meet with Andy Common as he shares his passion for letterpress printmaking and describes his history and technique with this age-old craft. I don't hunt, and I don't fish, and I don't canoe, I don't play golf. I just like to print. I always like to print. I've been printing um, approximately 44 years, and I've been doing letterpress printing, offset printing, newspaper printing, job shop printing. I've printed, um, I printed a while for um, screen printing, printing on t-shirts, so I've, I've printed on a lot of things. Printing became a passion when I was in grade school and took a tour with, or with Boy Scouts or um, Cub Scouts, I can't remember, and we um, toured the local newspaper in Bird Island. And I was just mesmerized by the sounds, the, the continuous motion of the machines, and uh, the first time I ever saw a linotype and actually got to see a linotype operate, it just kind of caught me and it's still there. Letterpress printing uh, has always been a, a process to me, but w when I got back into letterpress printing after being in offset printing, there were a lot of people that were coming up to me and they were they wanted to get into printmaking and there's a huge resurgence of uh, letterpress printing. I was just always amazed at the people who wanted to get into letterpress printing and I was like, well, you got to kind of learn how the paper gets pressed, the letters get pressed into the paper. Um, and so they do, and, and, but uh, they're coming at it from a different angle than, than I am. I've just always liked the, the working with paper and the ink and the, and the letters and the images. Uh, they're coming at it that this is really kind of cool and hip and I want to I start doing it now. I look at myself as a craftsman more than an artist. Early on in printing, when I, it, printing was a trade and it was a, um, very honorable trade and there were a lot of tramp printers who would move from town to town you could always find a job if you were a printer and so when I first started A to Z people would come in and go oh this is an art this is an art and I, rem I remind them that this is a craft it will always be a craft to me started out uh, the printing as a family thing that um, my son Zachary uh, was a printer at the time. I've always been in printing. Uh, I have a daughter, uh, Sunshine, who is not into printing, but she helped when we owned another plant. And, uh, and my wife has been in printing at, at some time, usually more in the offset printing. So we've been kind of printing as a family before, and so I just always imagined this as a place where they could come and do some of their own things and, and print some of the stuff that they want to and to learn and to just keep this um, craft alive. You know, some people call it an art, I still call it a craft. 
the the first press that I got um, was I, I, my son and I were working and volunteering at the newspaper association in the at the state fair has a, a paper that they print every day letter press and we've always been involved in that and a, a lady came up and introduced me to her father who had had a press for 40 years and he was going to be moving and he couldn't move it again and they had no room at the um, historical society so I said I'll just take your name and after our shift I was talking with my son and he said geez dad we should just put up a garage and and just print cards and I said okay so I called him back so we bought the, uh, the press behind me uh, a bank of type and a paper cutter for a dollar we got the press we brought it back to Montevideo and we had to store it in the old Hollywood which is next door and the Hollywood was being saved by a group of business people and they were going to tear it down and as they tore that down they were going to have to tear this building down because we share a common wall and then when they saved the Hollywood this building didn't have to be torn down so as we were looking around on Main Street I just said well let's my, actually, my son said, geez, Dad, you should just buy the, bungalow, the old bungalow building. So we looked around and made a deal, and um, after that, it's, it's history. And my son, who at the time was a printing in Duluth uh, as an offset printer, his name is Zachary, and that's how A to Z started. So This building was originally a bungalow eat shop, is what it was called and uh, people would come before the movie or after the movie at the Hollywood Theater. Well, the bungalow, each shop had a secret recipe for their bungalow burgers and everybody talked about it and, and the only people, when they sold the restaurant, they always had to sell the secret recipe. So when, when we purchased the building, the only thing in the building was the old cash register and the safe. That's the only two things that were left after they moved out. And now I use the cash register. I got it working again and I meet a lot of people that, that come in and reminisce about the, the bungalow and they want to know if the secret recipe is in the safe and I'll say, well, it took me a few days to figure out the combination to get the safe open and there was a piece of paper in there. I left it underneath the carpet so it's still there. Could be the secret recipe. So. In making a, a card or a broadsheet or a wedding invitation, the the first step is I just talk to the people and find out what you know what they're looking at, what they've seen. Um, uh, so that's how the process starts for somebody who wants to do a, a job. Of course, their first question is, you know, how much is this going to cost? And I go, sometimes it isn't about the cost; it's about the process. And if it's if it's more than they want, then there's other options that we can do to get the product. And sometimes I'll run into something that just needs to be printed whether you're going to get paid for it or not. So uh, some, for me, it's the process. When I started doing cards um, and coming up with my Bad Andy cards, I started reading funny little tidbits or I'd see a t-shirt. And so I'd come back to the shop and I'd go in the back and I have drawers and drawers of different old-fashioned images because I can't draw and I can't carve blocks but I can find images so I'd find an image from the 40s or 50s that might go with an old saying and I'd print it on a card and um, that's that's all it is is lining up the letters putting them into a chase and proofing it moving it around it's not near as easy as it is on a computer but it's a lot more satisfying to me some of them are um, offensive to people, but as the sign says, when you come in, you read them at your own risk. The, the press behind me, once uh, I put ink on it, the rollers pick up ink and they transfer it to a form, which is called a chase, where I've locked in the different type or images that I want to print. And um, then you slide the paper in and pull the impression handle on and you can see it actually touch the paper and you can kind of hear it clunk. Paper um, comes in all different sizes, weights, colors, um, and then with the ink 
in the in getting the ink from one place onto the paper. And then sometimes it's just magical uh, when you set it up in the in the the way the ink falls on the paper. And I use a lot of different types of paper. I've I've through um, other uh, work that I do, I, I have um, cardboard, recycled cardboard, recycled paper, and sometimes some craft paper that I've printed on. And when I started printing on some of the um, cardboard or chipboard, they call it, it just the way the ink flowed onto it, it was just like a velvet type of thing. And I fell in love with it, and I just keep printing on all kinds of stuff. I'm here a lot at night. I'm here on weekends when we don't go places. Um, and so this is my garden. This is my church. This is, you know, so people are just amazed when they come in that there's a lot of stuff and, um, you know, it's just still fun. I like to print. The thing that keeps me going is I've never gotten tired of putting a blank sheet of paper in the press, having it make its revolution and have something printed coming out. That, that to me is still just everything about printing. So uh, until I get tired of that, I can, I'll continue doing and printing stuff, you know. Next, we'll take you into the home of Shalee Sands, a wildlife painter whose passion was sparked by her love for exploring the natural beauty of the great outdoors. <laughs> My art is as realistic as I can get it right now, but it's kind of being in the process of getting more realistic as the years go by. And eventually, I'd really like to get into hyperrealism um, and try to get my art to look just like a photo if I can. That's the type of art I do, and it's wildlife and equine art. So I do both wildlife and horses. And the reason is I've always loved horses; they're my number one favorite animal. I'd have to say, and so you can't really go away from that if that's your favorite animal so um, but yeah I just really like the both aspects of the wildlife and horse art. I've been drawing ever since I was little since I could hold a pencil probably and I don't know I just I've always liked drawing I've always liked animals and so that combination just kind of lent itself to me being an artist eventually I guess. The main thing that I try to show in my art is the sublime. That's the essence of my art. And um, the sublime is, in a sense, an extreme form of beauty. And so I really have always been attracted to things of beauty in nature. And when I see, for example, like a horse rearing or an elk bugling, I just really get a full sense of that sublime. And that's something I really want to capture in my art because it's such a powerful feeling. And when people see that and you can share that experience with other people, then I think it can be a really powerful thing. I actually used to paint for my head quite a bit and I, I kind of thought it was cheating to use photographs, which I know it's not now, but I felt that I wasn't challenging myself enough if I was using a photograph because I felt like it was cheating almost, but that's obviously not the case and you can't get as realistic as you need to be if you don't use photographs. And I actually don't use the exact photo itself. I tend to think of a composition in my mind or so and then um, once I figure that out then I try to find the references that will fit that composition. And so by the time the painting is done, I'll probably have used six or seven different reference photos to combine them all together to get what I initially thought of in my mind. For this particular reference, I'm just using the, I like the colors of these horses, and so I'm using that um, as kind of a guide. And if it's not a strong light, it's kind of a diluted light, and so I'm kind of going with that too. But obviously the poses are completely different from what I'm doing, so it's more about the colors for these. I don't know, it's really hard to pick a favorite painting. Um, I'm kind of hard on myself, I guess. Every artist is his worst critic, as the saying goes, and that's very true with me because I tend to, you know, I don't know, dislike my paintings more than I like them, but I do probably have a couple favorites. Um, one of them is Spirit Bear. 
the title is referring to an actual type of black bear. They're called spirit bears, but they're also called Kermode bears, and they're, there's only about 100 of them in the wild, and they live up in British Columbia. And when I learned about them, I just thought that was really cool. Like, th here's a almost like a subspecies of black bear that scientists think is what that is. And, you know, that's just a really neat concept that there's this elusive white bear that not very many people get to see. And it's just a really gorgeous animal. And it's something that I think kind of captures the essence of sublime because of that, you know, kind of high quality beauty that. I think that bear just kind of emits. Just that painting came together really nice and I just enjoyed the colors and the texture that I got from it. So that's probably one of my favorites. I also really like the Sights of Fall and that's another acrylic painting that I painted actually after that one. Um, and it's a pair of moose in kind of like a fall scene. And I just, again, really like the rich colors of that one and just kind of the composition and the overall scenery of it. Just kind of a scene if you stumbled upon it you'd really be wondering what you should either run or stay and watch a while because it's pretty cool. <laughs> Ducks are kind of funny if you really think about it. They're just this odd type of animal that swims around and I don't know, they're just odd little things, but they're really cute too. And so there's so many different varieties and species and um, things that you have to learn about them. And there's one thing with my paintings, I just love learning about the animals themselves before I paint so that my paintings are informed and it's an accurate representation of what they are. And so with the ducks especially, you have there's so many different varieties of them that it's fun to learn about you know, all the different habitats and um, the food they eat and all that stuff too. And so it's really good to um, learn about that and just figure out um, all the things you need to know about them. And I don't know, I guess I really like challenges too. And so the combination of different species I've never painted before with all this other information just really makes them fun. I believe this is the third year that I've started doing duck stamp contest entries. and. The first year I did it, it was just the Federal Duck Stamp Contest, and that's something that I've been really trying to pursue more because that's, again, something that can really help get my name out there. And um, it, it's a really a good challenge for, as an artist, too, especially one that wants to be realistic as possible because there's a lot of detail that goes into these. There's a lot of time and effort for um, very specific, I guess, rules that the judges have. If, like, they're looking for these you know, qualifications of your entry, and if you aren't just right, you're not going to get very far. So that, I think, really helps challenge me in that way, too. And it's something I've enjoyed doing. I didn't know I liked drawing and painting ducks as much as I do now. So um, that's something that I've been, you know, trying to pursue every year now, and it's something that I've really enjoyed, and it challenges me artistically so that, um, you know, it grows in more than way than one. Ideally, the dream direction is well, I'd really like to become a professional wildlife and equine artist. And I guess you could technically say that I'm a professional now, but I'd really like to be doing that full time as the career to um, you know, support my family in the future, that kind of stuff. I'd really like just to become um, a full time artist. And if I can achieve that dream somehow, someday, that would just be amazing because I've wanted that ever since I was little, since I was like, too. I just wanted to be an artist and so that's kind of where I'm still headed and hopefully someday that will become a reality. Now we'll take you on a walk with Jacinda Davis, a photographer whose style is highly influenced by her daily observations of local flavor. I used to struggle a lot with my subject matter with photography because I always felt that I needed to be out on a road trip with my friends to get good photos or 
I don't know, just a different place, any place but Wilmer. And so when I would come back home from trips, I would always just feel like I was in a slump, like there wasn't anything good here for me to capture. And so that's when I started making it a practice for myself to just go out on a walk and take notice of everything that's just around me. It may seem mundane. I think that I've seen it all before. I've lived here most of my life, but there's always something, something slight and subtle that I pick up on. And that excites me. You could be anywhere in the world and you could come across a beautiful photograph, a beautiful place that is worthy of being captured. There we have it. And that's how I arrive at a lot of my photographs, actually. It's just me out being in life and something... I see something that's a little different, something subtle. It could just be the way everything kind of perfectly aligns. It's the light. It's the texture. And that's how I make a lot of my photographs. They're just this way the world comes together in my life as kind of a meditation and a gratitude for the simple things in life that I might not recognize otherwise. For my personal work, I really enjoy shooting film. I enjoy shooting film in general because it causes me to slow down and really take notice of what it is I'm photographing. I shoot medium format film. I have a Mamiya 645 medium format camera and that's, I just love that thing. It weighs like a ton, but I'll still haul it around with me because I absolutely love it. I really enjoy shooting with film too because each camera has like a different a different style and when you pair that with a certain film you always get different types of results. When the Music Fades is a little project I did last summer. I wanted to combine my background in graphic design and photography in order to make a little artist booklet or zine. And I had always grown up hearing about Sunshine Music Festival as being a Wilmer native and when I was a little older I would go out there with my friends and have a lot of fun. And while I was there I would photograph the bands that I looked up to. But I really wanted to capture a different side of this festival. And so When the Music Fades is about me going to the Sunshine Grounds after the last song has been played, after all the bands and vendors have packed up and the Sunshiners have left. And it's a documentation of all the things that these people have left behind. I mean there were couches strewn about the landscape, you'd find bottles of water and they just seem like ordinary things. But I really wanted to capture them in a different light. And so these people bring these items that they find value in and then once it's over they just leave them there. They're suddenly worthless. And so it was interesting to see those things that once have value just sitting there and kind of like an empty and deserted landscape. When the music fades as just a beginning of a project, I'd like to go out there the summer again and explore it further, see what else I might find. Um, right now it's just a little booklet and zine for myself and I published it as a PDF to the internet and I'm trying to decide if I want to self-publish it in print form because there's something very different about a photograph being in printed form than digital. I can't quite put my finger on it which is part of the reason why I shoot film because I like that idea of the physical nature of photography but even when I shoot film I'm often scanning it into digital form it's just sitting there and so I really see when the music fades as becoming a larger project and possibly even adding on to what I've already photographed
quietness of a place, uh, the reflection, and just really a sense of solitude and peace. That's something that I hope that sometimes people might get a glimpse of in their own lives. And I think that's why I sometimes take photographs like that because it's an outpouring of myself and what I might want other people to feel and experience. And that's the kind of photographer I aim to be is just catching the culture around me. If I can't get out and go somewhere out west or like go halfway around the world, like I have where I am and I can share where I am with other people. That's all for this week. For more information, go to our website. See you again next time on Postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota, shalomhillfarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.